Hi everyone, uh, this is just a holding message. Um, we'll be with you shortly uh, when it's due to start at 1 p.m. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We'll give it a couple of minutes more um, and then we'll start. Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today for our third masterclass this year um, on progression. So uh, progression that supports people and business success. Um, so my name's Paula Kemp. I am the employer engagement lead at um, the Social Mobility Commission and just a few pieces of etiquette for today. Um, if you could all remain on mute. Um, if you do have any questions, um, then please ask them in the question box. Um, you're also able to comment on other people's questions, so you can add to any questions you see in there. Um, and this webinar will be recorded. And in fact, we'll also share with you the slides. So um, please um, uh, look out for those. I think some of them, some of you may have been shared them earlier um, if you don't have access to the screen. Um, so what's today all about? Well, um, in a moment, um, I'll talk you through some of the uh, tools that we have in our toolkit. 
that help employers to think about progression um, and also some research that's happened um, in certain industries that show where the challenges lie. Um, then we'll be joined by my colleague Edward Donkar who will be uh, running you through the uh, research that we published last uh, week uh, on the report on progression within the civil service navigating the labyrinth that was undertaken by one of our commissioners, um, Sam Friedman. Um, and most importantly for you as an employer to think about some of the action points that have been suggested on the back of that research. Um, and then we'll then go to Jason Gaboose, who'll be able to talk through progression in the civil service. And then we're joined by Jenny Baskerville and Jen Lee from KPMG, and they'll share their approach to progression. Um, and Jen will actually give us um, a, a bit of insight into her um, experience uh, in terms of progression and her progression story within KPMG. And we'll then go to questions. Um, and that'll be uh, obviously over to you uh, in terms of you posting questions in the chat. Um, and then we've got some key dates to share with you right at the end. Um, so if uh, that sounds like a plan, um, let's uh, let's move on with it. So I guess in the workforce, um, you know, how does social mobility relate to uh, to what employers are doing? So social mobility is the link between a person's um, occupation or income and that of their parents. Um, and so therefore, what we're interested in and what we're keen to ensure at the Commission as to our all the employers that we're working with is to ensure that your background or where you came from or where you start in life um, doesn't determine your future. Um, and so when we think about progression within a career, when you start your start working somewhere, um, you start to, you, you, you consider uh, your workplace to be a, metri uh, a, a meritocracy uh, where that you have the opportunity. If you have the skills and innovation, you'll have the opportunities to succeed uh, within that workplace and that career progression is open uh, to everybody. And it's, it's based on your performance, your skills, um, and also your potential, right? Um, but actually what we've found through um, evidence of once people are in organizations, um, there are, there's a real challenge for people from lower social economic backgrounds to then get on. Um, there are uh, invisible barriers or cultural hierarchy that you just uh, don't necessarily notice when you're, when you're in an organization. And, and um, you know, we'd like to thank all the um, industries and firms that have over the past year have taken part in um, gathering data to really understand the progression barrier uh, within their organization. So um, just a few examples here from for research. So the Bridge Group, group has undertaken some research um, in the legal sector, um, which showed that it takes a year and a half longer from those from lower social economic backgrounds on average um, to reach partner uh, within the legal profession uh, compared to the colleagues from a higher social uh, social groups. And then in the financial sector, um, there was some research public, published towards the end of last year that sh showed those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds took 25% longer to progress. And actually, this progression gap couldn't be explained by performance at all. Um, and this has actually led to a, a setting up of a task force to um, investigate and really take action in financial and professional services sector uh, to uh, tackle this, uh, this idea of progression within the sector. Uh, based on someone's social economic background. Uh, the Bridge Group, group uh, also took research, undertook research in uh, real estate firms um, and showed that um, they have a smaller proportion based on the national uh, benchmark. So uh, the workforce 16 plus um, of people from working class or lower socioeconomic background is 37%, and they have only 27% of their workforce come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And then half of those in senior positions are from the highest uh, socioeconomic background. So again, even those that are getting in aren't getting on. Um, our colleagues at the Creative Industries, the uh, PEC, which is the Policy and Evidence Centre, um, have undertaken research to show that those from privileged backgrounds are more than twice likely to land a job in the creative sector. And once you're in, um, you're almost 
certainly more likely to progress to managerial positions. Um, and then, as I said, we'll be reporting on the report that we issued last week, but that report within the civil service shows that those people from, many people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who enter the civil service don't go on to progress in the same way as those from advantaged backgrounds. So why is this? What are the challenges? Um, and so the reality is progression is quite often the last thing an organisation or an employer might tackle. So, um, many of the interventions require a real, um, a real sense of changing the culture and structure and support and opportunities so that staff really understand that progression is a key opportunity for them. Um, so I'm just going to talk through a, through a few of the, the points that, um, you know, research that we've done over the years has actually shown. So in terms of attraction myth, um, I think many of you, uh, especially if you've worked in the DNI space, uh, you know, we talk a lot about outreach, we talk a lot about hiring um, and really um, challenging though the, the support that we give uh, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds to get into the industry. Um, but that is not the only solution. And once they're in, we need to make sure that they can, that, you know, they feel comfortable to stay. Um, we have found through research that we've taken that, that employer funding training is more likely to be given to those from a higher socioeconomic background. And in fact, um, we did a survey with all of you participants before, before the session. Um, and many of you, uh, well, only 20% of you said training was available for every member of staff. Um, so that also shows that it's quite a targeted uh, proportion of people that receive that training. Um, and then when we go to certain industries, um, there may be um, a view that, uh, you know, if it's a fast paced retail, hospitality sector, care sector, for instance, it's a fast paced industry with a high turnover of staff. Um, and so there may be a, a tendency for organisations not to want to think about training um, in terms of um, prioritising investment um, over anything else uh, within their organisation. Um, research also shows individuals um, can lack confidence in their ability to progress and have low expectation of employers to provide this training and this access to, to progression. Um, and in fact, 27% of you told us that you, you um, only 27% of you rather, um, told us that you have targeted and ring fenced um, pr training programs for those from um, under, underrepresented groups. Obviously we've spoken a bit about the longer progression time, but um, what a lot of you have told us is that you that thirty percent of you don't actually collect data that uh, or look at the data or have the data available that shows what that progression gap looks like within your organisation, and that can really help you build the narrative with your senior leaders uh, in terms of 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 um, making them consider uh, that there is a barrier uh, and really explore where those barriers exist. Um, Many organisations uh, still tilt their norms towards privileged backgrounds, and this can be a real challenge in terms of um, if you if you've got leadership, senior leadership who come from a higher socioeconomic background, um, in terms of them understanding the rest, you know, the the, the people they work with, um, and so there's a real need to drive that cultural change at at, at the leadership uh, part of the organisation, um, and. You know, some frontline staff, uh, frontline co colleagues uh, don't see their jobs as, as career and, and report are having other priorities in, in life. So therefore, um, you know, maybe don't take advantage of the training that's offered, especially if it's if it's a selection process to, to, to go for the training. So it should that should be something to consider when you're offering training opportunities. Um, and, and what we have found is the career paths are different from for those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, they often um, self-select into technical roles. Um, 
And part of the challenge they then face is any stretch roles or um, accelerator roles that are um, given or have the opportunity, people have the opportunity to take forward that then lead you into being visible to more senior leaders or having uh, your name against a project or a, or a, a, or a, a role that would then help you progress within the organisation. And those are then those those opportunities are then less um less available for those in in those some of those technical backgrounds and they don't often you know lead to higher opportunities um so through our research we've shown that it, that it, the culture around training and progression um is a real driver for change and it's where organizations have leaders that prioritize that staff development um, to increase engagement and staff satisfaction. Um, and they review it, they view it as part of their brand, they have strong budget behind it. Um, but but all the sort of, you know, we've we've spoken to smaller organizations who who tap into resources that are available for training. There are lots of free uh, uh, training resources that that smaller businesses can tap into if they don't have that budget as well. So um you know there's a there's that, that then leads to an expectation that all staffs at all level have um the opportunity to have training and also career conversations with their line managers um and then that helps you understand who needs what support where and what that level of um you know opportunity for those stretch roles can come from and really um you know provide opportunity across all of uh, your workforce rather than a selected targeted um group of people um and then they see the opportunity of retaining staff it's incredibly expensive to uh you know, for people to, to move on. Um, it's expensive to recruit. Um, it also takes a long time for people to embed in an organization and understand their culture and their values. Um, and so then if, you, if you're valuing that training, and especially if it's top talent that's just being undervalued, um, if you're not looking at your top talent, then someone else is. Um, and that was that's something that I, I think really like you to have a, a think about um, in terms of, underrepresented staff um, at the higher levels of your organization. So where can you, where do you go from here? What can you do? And so I'm just gonna, we'll obviously share these slides with you afterwards. So I'm just gonna uh, really talk through a couple of these key points. Um, and then also I'm sure more of these will be drawn out from um, the discussions from our uh, esteemed panel uh, uh, and guest speakers. So. There's a real need to build that leadership and management commitment um, in terms of uh, training and develop, uh, staff development. Um, and so there's a real opportunity to put this in the performance metrics of your leaders um, and, you know, ensuring that, that they have these, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with all of their team in terms of, you know, what's next for them. Um, and building that culture uh, behind uh, your organization and, and that, that you're willing to talk about kind of the barriers and and so those those organizations that part uh, partook in in that research it's a it's that's really driving them to have a think about you know what can they do differently within their organization now that they've got this this data behind them um, and also it just links to you know workforce and enablers so if you think about um, within a career pathway um, for for any of your organization you know any employee within your organization is is have that incremental steps within within the organization in terms of what's the next step for somebody to achieve um, and especially even if though you don't have those different grades within an organization you know what what other opportunities could they take on that are stretch roles or could they move uh, take a sideways move that would lead to more progression opportunities and it's really helping someone to understand what pathway they could take within the organization to pro progress and and ensuring that you have these monthly performance meetings that training is offered uh, to uh, you know the workforce and that it's communicated really well what's available um, and you can use um, you can formalize uh, some of the informal sponsorship that goes on that 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 sometimes tilts towards those from higher 
socioeconomic backgrounds or, or um, not necessarily underrepresented groups. So, so are there some mentorship programs or sponsorship programs um, that you can undertake and maybe get support from any of your people networks or staff networks that you may have that support social mobility um, to really drive that change? And I think also your social mobility network could give you the opportunity to um, to actually undertake some of the training for you and support those their colleagues to have the careers that they want. Um, and then, you know, please do um, revisit our toolkits um, to show in, in terms of what data you can collect and how you can actually really understand where the barriers are in the progression uh, pipeline for your employees. Um, have a think about, um, you know, clear different definition of roles and, and offer them the opportunity to be to, to be very flexible um, in terms of what um, you know what that looks like because we do find that uh, you know that will then help people um, have the opportunity to, to tap into those roles with that extra flexibility um, and I would say you know definitely have a look at your performance promotion and pay policies, but not only the policies, what does it actually look like within your organization? Um, and rigorous success planning, succession planning can help you understand where gaps are for people and where they need training and development and just communicate this widely. Um, and one of the last things just to touch upon really is, um, you know, if, if you've, you've got clients who have a clear commitment on inclusion and they want to see um, you know, they want to see your your organisation uh, map the communities that they work with. Um, and so therefore, you know, in terms of those stretch roles and projects, it's, it's open for lots of people to get involved into, into that. Um, so I just want to um, finish with a couple of examples from retail um, in terms of um, what they've told us in terms of driving uh, inclusive change. So it's just a small, uh, smaller supermarket, uh, but they have 250 employees across Wales um, and they really nurture the progression of their frontline staff. So their training community, the programs are well advertised and there's a real culture of commitment from the leadership team that it's important to the company's brand um, that you know, employees have the opportunity to, to progress within this organisation and, and they offer opportunities to work in different branches or in the head office, which also exposes employees to more career opportunities. Um, and then lastly, uh, an international sandwich and coffee chain, and I'm sure many of you may recognise who this is because I think they've gained a, a real reputation for investing in training and development of their employees. Um, and so therefore, you know, some of their employees who may have started on a real casual basis have stayed loyal to the organisation and progressed within its rank. And that, that comes from that commitment from the managers, the store managers in terms of embedding training as a priority. For them. Uh, so hopefully that's given you some thought for how you might take progression forward in your organisation. Um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome Edward Donker. He's uh, a colleague of mine in Social Mobility Commission who's an employee engagement lead um, and I'll hand over to you now, Edward. Uh, thank you Paula for that introduction. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Edward, uh, employee engagement lead at the Social Mobility Commission. And I'll briefly give you an overview of our of our new report, Navigating the Labyrinth, and look into some of its key findings and actions, which will hopefully stimulate some of the conversation in the panel discussion ahead. So if we move on to the next slide, Navigating the Labyrinth is the Social Mobility Commission's report on socioeconomic background and career progression within the civil service. So the report represents an independent audit and the first investigation of how socioeconomic background shapes career progression. The research found that while those from low socioeconomic backgrounds get in, they do struggle to get on. If we have a quick look at the methodology, the data used in the study was taken from analysis of the 2019 Civil Service People Survey, which was a survey of over 300,000 civil servants. The study focused on the key question, parental occupation, so the job of the main breadwinner when the respondent was age 14. So it also triangulated with data on schooling, free school meals, and self-assessed socioeconomic background, and was supplemented by data from the ONS Labour Workforce Survey. 
So the study also conducted 104 in-depth interviews carried out by civil service employees at grade seven and above. So that's middle management and above in four departments, the Treasury, the uh, Department for Transport, HM Revenue and Customs, and the Cabinet Office. Just move on to the next slide to look at a bit around the data. Uh, so the data shows that the civil service has significantly more staff from higher social economic backgrounds than other industries and the wider UK workforce. If you look at the slide, 54% uh, 54 of civil servants are from advantaged and professional managerial backgrounds, compared to 37% in the national workforce. However, it also showed the proportion of civil servants from disadvantaged backgrounds is much closer to the UK workforce as a whole. So if we uh, look into the data a little bit more and uh, move on to the next slide. This slide shows the socio-economic background of the civil service workforce broken down by grading. So starting with the most junior grade, so the AA, AO, through to middle management, and then looking at the SES, that's the senior civil service, the most senior civil servants. Uh, the data shows that the higher up the ranks of the civil service, the less socio-economically diverse the workforce becomes, with only 18% of senior civil servants being from a working class or low socio-economic background. So this figure has remained essentially unchanged over the past 50 years with some caveats as uh, comparisons to 1967, they're not direct uh, due to the uh, occupational structure of the UK changing. However, it does give us a touch point uh, for how the overall composition of the civil service has relatively, has stayed relatively unchanged since 1967. These figures demonstrate that while many people from low socioeconomic backgrounds who enter the civil service don't go on to progress in the same way as those from more advantaged backgrounds. It shows that it's not just about getting in, but also about getting on. So if we just take a look at uh, the seven key findings from the report, whilst uh, some of these findings are more specific to the civil service, they do have relevance to different industries, sectors and organisations, which we hope all employers can reflect on. So looking at the, the, the first key finding, so accessing info, informal guides and accelerator roles. The study found that certain civil service jobs help to facilitate fast track progression. The roles such as working in ministerial private office or working in a core civil service department. Now, awareness of these accelerator roles is contingent on access to either senior guides or networks, which uh, provide invaluable knowledge about how civil service works and how best to navigate it. So the study found that this process has advantaged those from high socioeconomic backgrounds. Moving on to the next key finding, negotiating organizational ambiguity. The investigation found civil servants seeking the advancement of grade or salary routinely faced situations where formal guidance or behaviour is unclear. So these grey areas included interactions with hiring managers, requests for promotions and embellishing job applications. And the, uh, the study found those from higher socioeconomic backgrounds tended to use this ambiguity of these grey areas to negotiate promotional opportunities. Then looking at the next finding, which is the Whitehall effect. So more top grade posts are in London and the proximity to Whitehall is critical for increasing visibility within the civil service. So the central department, so Treasur Treasury number 10 and the cabinet office are predominantly staffed by London-based civil servants, but access to a London-based career track is stratified by socioeconomic background. So those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds tend to sort into regional positions which affect progression. Then that links uh, nicely to the next finding, which is sorting and bottlenecks in career tracks. But the report found that those from low socioeconomic backgrounds often opt or sort into occupational uh, 
operational career tracks which have ceilings in progression. So some join at uh, lower grades where there is where the work is more operational, whereas others join at higher grades but still sort into operational roles and uh, as the skill set is seen as more transparent, uh, tangible and meritocratic. So the policy skill set on the other hand is seen as vague and dependent on mastering behavioural co codes which are not inclusive and favour those from advantaged backgrounds. So if you just look at the, the, the next key finding, which was navigating do, uh, dominant behavioural codes. So the report found that the key behaviour code at the top grades of the civil service revolves around what the study terms uh, studied neut neutrality. So this incorporates a particular RP accent, a style of speech, and an intellectual orientation of culture and politics. So those from low socioeconomic backgrounds found this code alienating and intimidating, but one which they must uh, assimilate in order to succeed. Looking at the next finding, people from high socioeconomic backgrounds downplay their privilege. So the, re the research found that one in four of those from self-assessed uh, self as coming from low socioeconomic backgrounds actually have parents who did do professional or managerial jobs. So these people often located their origin, not in their own upbringing, but in extended family histories of upward mobility. And this misidentification blinds them from considering their own privileges that they have enjoyed and it sometimes makes them erect socioeconomic barriers to progression. But finally, looking at the seventh finding, which was cumulative disadvantage. So the, the, the report uh, explores the additional barriers that women and people from ethnic minority backgrounds face in the civil service, so alongside socioeconomic backgrounds. The report revealed that whilst there was little difference between the overall socioeconomic composition of male and female civil servants. Low socioeconomic men were more likely to talk openly about their backgrounds and feel more comfortably uh, displaying these markers. In comparison to low socioeconomic background women, largely choosing to conceal their background, presume, uh, presuming such a disclosure will only leave them vulnerable to negative judgment. And for ethnic minorities, particularly black civil servants, the report outlined how they were subject to negative and stereotypical assumptions about black working class communities, irrespective of their own socioeconomic background. So now we've considered the, the seven key findings, let's have a quick look at the action plan. So alongside the report, the SMT has also published an action plan with recommendations for how the civil service might respond to these issues. So we, we do recognise there isn't a silver bullet to solving these problems, and they as they do include complex cultural issues which require a joined up approach. However, there are many lessons here for the civil service and employers across the country to learn from. So you can view the actions and review how they map against your own workforce. For instance, one of the actions is workforce-wide reporting on socioeconomic backgrounds. So this includes collecting and driving up response rates to socioeconomic diversity questions. Because ultimately, the success of any strategy is underpinned by the quality of data collected and reported. So another one of the actions is uh, thinking beyond Whitehall and London. So this includes targets for the number of senior private office and policy roles outside of London in order to expand the regional presence at all grades and all roles. And that, here's the 12, and then you can go and view them and map them against your own workforce and sector and organisation. Finally, we would in, uh, encourage all employers to look at the report and the action plan and reflect on how your organisation can fo focus on progression everybody in your ranks. Uh, so I will now hand over to my colleague uh, Jason. So Jason is di uh, Deputy Director of Civil Service Diversity and Inclusion and hear a bit more about his thoughts and reflections not only on the, the report but progression uh, and also his own experiences. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Edward, and good afternoon, everyone. So firstly, my thanks to the Social Mobility Commission for inviting me to present today's, uh, today's session. I'm really pleased to be here and have the opportunity to share, but more importantly, learn from the other speakers. As Edward said, my name is Jason Gaboose, and I am the Deputy Director overseeing Civil Service Diversity and Inclusion, heading up the Civil Service Inclusive Practice Team here in the Cabinet Office. Now focus on establishing the central strategic approach to DNI for the civil service, working closely with practitioners in the HR community across all departments, professions, and functions, covering an organization of over 440,000 colleagues. Our emphasis is on being data driven, evidence led, and delivery focused. DNI practice not for its own sake, but rather to seek to better equip the civil service to deliver effectively. A genuine focus on delivery to the citizen through fairness at work and an inclusive culture, one that enables creativity and innovation, promoting improved utilisation and productivity through optimising the full capacity of our available talent. What is absolutely key is ensuring diversity and inclusion are being progressed through embedding and mainstreaming it across all aspects of the organisation, such as recruitment, talent training and what we're here to discuss today, progression. And I want to talk to you about the civil service context, progression in the civil service, and also provide some hopefully useful case studies. So on this slide here, you can see the civil service consists of a large collection of organisations which vary in size, purpose and grade makeup. This can make the challenge of equalising access and likelihood of progression an even more complex one. For example, each department has its own vision, strategy, priorities, HR systems, workforce data, cultures and ways of working. The Institute for Government's images that you can see on the screen are taken from their Whitehall Monitor report for 2020. And it highlights the variance between our departments in terms of their size and grade composition. Some have more senior roles like the Cabinet Office, whereas some have a more triangular hierarchy like at HMRC and the Home Office. Some of our departments have significant focus on operational delivery, whereas others are policy departments who deliver through agencies and arm's length bodies. And overall, as outlined, there are over 445,000 civil servants with just under 6,000 at the highest level at SES. And what, is hopefully, this, what this hopefully demonstrates is that there is no silver bullet, as Edward described. No one size fits all solution on how to lever a significant, successful, and sustained change in terms of an approach to progression or broader DNI objectives. Moving on to slide three to take a look at progression in the civil service, taking a data driven approach is key. Data has been absolutely instrumental in identifying where the barriers to progression are for us as an employer. In 2017, a public commitment was made to establish a baseline for socioeconomic diversity of the civil service. At that time, there was not an agreed or readily available measure. And so we worked with the Office for National Statistics, academics, private sector employers, and the SMC to create a set of measures for employers to use to collect data on SEB of their workforce. And this was published back in May, 2018. We included these measures in our 2019 People Survey to establish a working baseline of the civil services socioeconomic diversity. The response rate was high, with 95 to 98% of over 300,000 respondents online answering these questions. And of course, these responses were voluntary and self-assessed. The SMC research has highlighted thematic barriers to progression, and this is helping open a really insightful, targeted discussion on socioeconomic diversity and social class within the civil service. Particularly refreshing for me is the focus provided on cumulative barriers, connecting socioeconomic background to gender and ethnicity. Report identifying black staff are often subject to negative and stereotypical assumptions about black working class communities, irrespective of their own socioeconomic background and identifying low said women are more underrepresented as senior grades. These insights will help inform targeted action. A quick personal reflection. So I started the civil service in 2002 as an administrative assistant, which is our most junior grade. 
And since then, I've worked at every grade in between that and my current position as a senior civil servant. I've worked across a mixture of professions, but primarily worked my way up through an operational delivery career track, working in operational casework in immigration and all outside of London. I absolutely recognise that mine is not a standard path to the senior civil service. And I recognise that the labyrinth analogy used in this report is a useful one. There are many paths to success, so many wonderful opportunities in the civil service, but it can appear to be easier for some. It just sometimes appear to have that secret map directing to success. That is why me and my team are keen to provide everyone that map to navigate in the system. The system that truly does recognise that it's staff that are key to success and effective delivery to the citizen. We have and always we have always been and always will remain the front runner in this space and continue to be so. And we are proud to have one of the largest data sets on social mobility, if not necessarily the best. And we are also very proud that 15 civil service organisations are in the Social Mobility Foundation Employer Index top 75 in 2020. So there are pockets of best practice that already exist. And we are working to scale these up as well as look to new fresh areas of focus driven by our data. But we absolutely recognise that we want to be better. And this is why we worked closely with the SMC on this report, opening our doors and our books to scrutiny to enable us to progress, not just with our data, but underpinning evidence too. We will draw on the insights from this report to inform future work program on socioeconomic diversity, building on some of the great work that we've already done. So moving on to slide four, let me share some best practice and case study examples with you, which will hopefully be of interest. So whilst the SMC report shows us, shows us that there's clearly more progress to be made on socioeconomic diversity in the service, there are examples of best practice. I'd like to outline three areas of work in relation to progression that covers access via internships and apprenticeships, facilitating progression by your sponsorship and mentoring programmes, and finally, facilitating equal access to progression via, for example, our Places for Growth programme, which is all about moving roles outside of London as part of the levelling up agenda. So internships and apprenticeships. In terms of access, the civil service fast stream, where our flagship graduate programme has made a range of changes to improve socioeconomic diversity within the fast stream. Since implementation of the Bridge Group Social Mobility Recommendations in 2016, lower socioeconomic appointment trend has increased annually for the fast stream, and the success rate since 2016 has tripled. So absolutely positive steps are taken, but keen and recognise that more needs to be done. Our early diversity and summer diversity internship programmes are aimed at increasing representation from underrepresented backgrounds specifically those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, ethnic minorities and those with a disability. Our data on SDIP and EDIP is promising, showing SDIP SEB in 2020, 31.9% application stage and 25.8% appointment, and EDIP SEB at 2020, an application success rate 29.8% and 27% at appointment. Those getting a successful appraisal on the internships get a fast pass to our fast stream assessment centres. This fast tracks candidates to the final stage of the process. And in 2018-19, we saw 33.6% of lower SEB interns being appointed. All of our departments have apprenticeship targets, but we recognise there's room for improvement to make sure the right groups of individuals are targeted. Departments are leading ex excellent and positive work too. For example, DWP's Social Mobility Apprenticeship Scheme. DWP offers 18 month fixed term apprenticeship opportunities to young unemployed with, with little or no work history or qualifications. The programme aims to identify people who would not otherwise be successful in securing employment, training and educating and providing work experience. This is AO and EO level entry, studying for level two, three apprenticeship, depending on existing knowledge and skills. This would be in business administration or customer service practitioner and functional skills. Nationwide placements 
Nationwide placements with apprentices working alongside existing employees who act as buddies sharing experience and knowledge. DGP programmes operate through exception two of the civil service recruitment principles, also called the Live Chances programme. The apprentices receive training in work related skills, including eight mandatory workshops. And this covers things like CV writing, behaviours, body language, interviewing techniques, and job searches. Both the training provider and line managers provide intensive support during the final months of the apprenticeship to help the apprentices secure permanent employment. And they allow specific time to dedicate to job search and time off for interviews. Now, these access interventions are all about widening the talent pool to a more diverse range so that our talent, talent pipeline for progression as individuals from a broad range of backgrounds. So moving on to facilitating progression through sponsorship and mentoring programmes, the Ministry of Justice has led some exciting work in this area. The MOJ recognised that staff from lower socioeconomic backgrounds do not progress at the same rates as those from more privileged backgrounds. In 2018, they developed Catapult, a mentoring scheme for those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and the first of its kind in central government. This had the aim of improving confidence, increasing aspiration and supporting progression. 2020 launched a cross-government mentoring and, sponsor and sponsorship scheme pilot for low socioeconomic background employees. This included 10 government departments who took part in this pilot. And on this pilot, employees were paired with a senior leader at grade seven and above within or outside their profession to be mentored for six to 12 months. It's a really interesting program and it's designed to build confidence, promote job shadowing, develop skills and provide an internal network, which are all important to inspire and support employees' progress. The scheme has been commended by both the mentors and mentees involved, with an 80% satisfaction program rating and 88% finding the sessions provided really interesting and useful. And in terms of recommending to others, 96% of the mentors involved would, as would 92% of the mentees. Interestingly, within a year, a third of these mentees progressed or moved departments. This year, the scheme opens across the civil service with 500 places to widen the impact, ensuring all voices are heard from all backgrounds. And finally, we are very much thinking beyond Whitehall. Facilitating equal access to progression via our Places for Growth programme will bring the government closer to the people it serves relocating 22,000 roles out of London by 2030. Plans including more than 1,000 to Scotland from the Cabinet Office and the FCDO, as well as DFT's new second headquarters in Birmingham and the Northern Hub in Leeds and MHCLG in Wolverhampton. This will see more government roles, including many more policy roles located outside of London with several civil service hubs within commuting distance of socially, social mobility cold spots, for example, at Hull, Gateshead and Bolton. We want to ensure that the right people are working in the right places to deliver the best outcomes for citizens. The need to level up the nations and regions of the UK and ensure the government is close to and reflects all of the citizens it serves. A more geographically diverse civil service and public service will better serve the public and ministers. Thank you for your time today, and I'll now pass over to Jenny Baskerville. Thanks, Jason. Um, and also thank you, Paula, and uh, the Social Mobility Commission for inviting us to share our approach at KPMG with you uh, today. I'll be speaking first just to give a, an overview of what we've been doing at KPMG. And then Jen Lee, our Liverpool office senior partner, will be sharing her personal story of progression within the firm. So if I can move on to the next slide. Thanks, Paula. Thank you. So KPMG has had a long standing commitment to social mobility um, from being the first accredited living wage employer to extensive social mobility outreach, particularly across social mobility cold spots, to being the first firm to publish comprehensive socioeconomic background workforce data back in 2016. And we've been reporting on that annually ever since. Before I suppose we could unpack any specific challenges that were being faced around progression, as has already been said, I think today, a really important first step was capturing robust socioeconomic background workforce data. So we commenced this process back in 2014 with one question around parental 
education um, and it gradually evolved over the next two years as more best practice um, became available and we landed on parental occupation as our main measure um, and we've been capturing that data since 2016. Then in 2017, um, we commissioned an internal piece of research by the Bridge Group, who have also been mentioned several times today in the work that they do. Um, and that was specifically looking at uh, progression within the organization with a socioeconomic background, gender and ethnicity lens as well. And Sam Friedman, as one of the fellows of the Bridge Group, and of course, commissioner, um, was involved in, in that research too. So what did the research look at? Um, it consisted of both quantitative and qualitative research. So there was 2 million data points analysed um, over a 10-year sort of period, looking at our colleagues' journeys, um, and also qualitative interviews with a number of our staff members. Um, it's been really, really interesting reading the research that was recently published and obviously has been shared today around the civil service, as I think some of the themes that were arising are not too dissimilar to what we found at KPMG. So, for example, there was sort of points to um, the existence of dominant working cultures um, and how I suppose colleagues felt the need to assimilate. Um, there was tensions in the narrative around inclusion, diversity and social equality, and therefore colleague behaviour, not matching necessarily the narrative that they were hearing. There was challenges around how we define talent internally um, and therefore any objectivity that we would want to see in measuring that talent. There was talk of sponsorship and um, who was getting that sponsorship. There were concerns around performance management not always being sort of equally um, assessed and also one of our biggest challenges around work allocation. So within an organisation like KPMG, how um, you get on a specific project can often be down to resourcing teams, but also individual leaders within the business. And we wanted to unpack how that was being fairly allocated or not fairly allocated and how we can unblock some of those barriers. So the recommendations that we had from that research back in 2017 helped inform our IDSE strategy and interventions that followed. And we've just put a couple examples on the slide, but I will talk them through for you. So comms was at the heart of, I suppose, our response to this. We launched something called our Fairer Futures campaign, and the imagery that you can see on our slides come from that campaign. What did this campaign do? It sort of outlined what we wanted to aim for across inclusion, diversity, and social equality, but also within corporate responsibility. So what was our combined vision? Um, what was our leadership support? on this agenda and critically, what were our colleagues' stories? And I think that was where it was most impactful. So if you type Fairy Futures in um, to Google and put in KPMG, um, you will get access to the video that we shared. And I think that was really impactful because it, it showed what colleagues' stories were. It kind of told a different narrative, not just from, from my team, as to what it felt like to work at KPMG, who they were, what their characteristics were, kind of what made them who they are. Um, and that was a really powerful story. Um, it allowed people to get behind um, what we were working on within KPMG, but also allowed us the opportunity to bust some myths um, around kind of IDSE more broadly. Then we moved on to, I suppose, the systems uh, and what issues there might be there that needed addressing. So as I said, work allocation came up as, as a big theme for colleagues, you know, but what were those career enhancing opportunities that people were getting access to? Um, so we've designed a work allocation framework. Um, it helps us to work with different parts of the business because it does differ according to which part of the business you're in, um, which opportunities and experiences were enabling colleagues to get ahead, um, and how were those opportunities being allocated. Again, the framework and the principles and the actions that we're taking are, built, are based on principles around growth, because we've already said that this is absolutely um, IDSE kind of focused on kind of growth for the business. Our ambition to support progression of all of our colleagues, but also again pointing to fairness and why that we needed to address this. We looked at our people processes end to end, um, so we were very clear as to what exceptions wouldn't be um, allowed, uh, where colleagues wanted to bypass particular processes, and we built in specific guardrails where needed. So, for example, we look at proportionality within our promotions um, from an IDSE perspective. So these processes are fundamentally there to drive consistency and fairness. We also then looked at our people and the culture that we had within the organisation. 
So we focused on enhancing our IDSE learning for all of our colleagues. Um, we looked at the training we were offering our performance managers because that had been an area, as I said, that had come up through the research. We had a personal development program called GROW that we expanded over time to therefore include colleagues from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And the results of that program have been great in terms of retention and promotions. Um, and we also most recently have launched our national social mobility network. I think I saw one or two questions around um, the networks in the chat. Um, that's been sort of following a really successful launch in Scotland where they already had a social mobility network. And we've got members and committee leads now helping build a more inclusive environment, sharing the interventions they'd like to see from the organization and fundamentally helping us really work with our colleagues to share their stories, make sure that they can be proud to share where their background is from, building that kind of psychological safety that we all know is so important. Building on this, I suppose more broadly, we continue to work within our sector where there are particular challenges and across other sectors too, um, including our client and supply base on this agenda. We really want to contribute and help move the dial forward in terms of progression. I think as some, someone said around access being kind of a particular focus for a long time, we really want to focus in on progression with, with other businesses as well. So for example, KPMG um, works on access accountancy and supports um, other access accountancy members. They've got an increased focus on progression to professional status. So we're working with them closely on that. We're also part of the City of London's task force that Paula mentioned earlier in terms of working to improve socioeconomic diversity at senior levels in the financial and professional services. So if I can just summarise, um, I suppose at KPMG, we really wanted to take an evidence based approach um, so that we knew exactly what the barriers were within our own organisation and could then design the specific interventions to address them. I'd be honest and say that there was no silver bullet um, to help uh, address all of what we uncovered. Um, instead, a series of interventions um, that involved looking at both the system as well as the behavioural change that we required within the organisation. Obviously, we've still got work to do, um, but we are starting to see some improvements and we're obviously using ongoing data analysis to continue to assess where we need to focus our efforts. I'll now hand over to our office senior partner, Jen Lee, um, who will share her personal story of progression within the firm. Over to you, Jen. Thanks, Jenny, and good afternoon, everyone. As Jenny said, my name is Jennifer Lee and I'm Office Senior Partner for KPMG in Liverpool. I'm the youngest Office Senior Partner in the UK firm and I've been asked to share my story with you today. So I grew up in Kensington, Liverpool, which is one of the most deprived areas of the city. So to put that into perspective, the life expectancy for someone from Kensington and Liverpool is some 10 years less than someone from Kensington and London. I had a really happy childhood and I didn't think that my life was any different from anyone else's. And for the majority of my childhood, we only had one salary, um, which was my mum's as my dad had ill health. I went to the local primary school, then state secondary school. And it was during my secondary school years that I realised that I didn't have some of the same things that other children my age had, like the latest designer clothes or central heating and hot water. So. My parents had always told me that I was bright and I could do great things and that if I worked really hard, I could be anything I wanted to be. And I really believe that. And I'm so fortunate that I had their guidance and support and I absolutely wouldn't be where I am today without them. So I did well at school, but there's a huge inequality that lies in the heart of our education system. There are really high performing young people at low attaining schools who are just not being supported in the way they should. I remember being at a careers event at school and being told that I'd be well suited to a job as an air hostess. Well, that's quite specific and that's a great job if that's the career you want to pursue. But I think I said I wanted to work in business and travel the world and I'd never been on a plane before. So I didn't actually know what the job of an air hostess entailed. I had absolutely no one to guide me. I didn't know what careers I could have apart from the ones that I'd been exposed to in my everyday life. But I knew I should go to university as that's what my mum and dad had told me was the right thing to do. But I was going to be the first member of my family to go to university. I had no guidance as to what I would do once I got there or when I finished. But I did get there. I went to Essex University and I wanted to go to a new town where I could get a different perspective on the big wide world. 
I qualified for a grant for uni, but I worked four jobs whilst I was at university to ensure that I could eat and live. Um, each weekday at 3pm, I'd go to a cleaning job at the local school. I also work Friday and Saturday nights in a nightclub as the cloakroom assistant. I was the only person in that nightclub trying to study economics with music blaring in the background. I worked in a retail store on a Saturday and as a hotel chambermaid on a Sunday. And in the holidays, I worked full time as a bank teller. So I certainly wasn't afraid of hard work. When I graduated from university, I had no connections to the business world, no network and no mentors. The majority of roles that I was drawn to were based in London and I couldn't afford to live there. So I applied for graduate roles um, outside of London that also had an office in Liverpool. So I took one role and after nine months, I decided that that wasn't the career for me. So I looked at other roles in Liverpool and applied for a graduate position at KPMG. My degree was in, account was in accountancy and finance and I'd never thought of being an accountant as I didn't think I'd really fit in, particularly not at a big four accountancy firm. But one of my friends had started with a different firm and she told me that they pay to train you for your accountancy exams. And I love learning. Um, so my friend's advice, I decided to give it a go. And the people that I met at interview were really encouraging. And here I am today, 20 years later, as office senior partner for KPMG in Liverpool. Now I've been extremely fortunate to be offered that graduate position with KPMG as there was so much competition for a place. And I'm really grateful that I work for a firm who really does believe in fairness and equality. And I've received guidance and, and support from both male and female mentors throughout my career. And that's definitely helped me get to where I am today. And it wasn't easy joining a firm where I felt like the majority of people I met were better educated than me. I wasn't as eloquent as others. So when I was presenting, I just didn't have the same vocabulary to express my point of view. I had to look up every Latin reference or long word that people had written in a report. And I also had a strong accent, as you can hear, um, which I was really self-conscious about. And when people made jokes about politics or current affairs, I'd laugh along, but I really didn't get the punchline. And those may seem like really insignificant things to others, but to me, they were huge. Did I fit in? Was it good enough to be here? That imposter syndrome was rearing its head all the time. And on a daily basis, I felt like I wasn't good enough. I wasn't smart enough. And this wasn't because colleagues were, were mean to me. Actually, on the contrary, my colleagues were fantastic. But this is my own insecurities rearing their head every day. I was in constant competition with myself to become more learned so I could feel more included. Yet I was included in everything and I just never felt that way myself. And no one in my family understood my job or what I did and neither did my friends outside work. And it wasn't until I became office senior partner at KPMG that I felt comfortable talking about my socioeconomic background. As throughout my career, I just wanted to fit in. I wanted to be accepted by my peers as an equal. I didn't want people to think about my background and that it was any different to theirs. I'd actually been really scarred by a comment made in previous employment where they were gonna do a youth outreach program. And I've been at one of the kick kickoff meetings for this and, and I was thinking, wow, this is an amazing idea. I can't wait to be involved in this. And then one of the senior people in the meeting joked, you know, I don't mind doing this, but imagine getting pairs with one of those kids from Kensington. But he was talking about me. I was one of those kids from Kensington. I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me. Here I was in this big organization as a graduate, trying my best to fit in. And that one throwaway comment from someone who was just trying to be funny made me feel like people were always gonna judge me because of my background. And I traveled a lot with that organization and that individual offered me a lift home one evening. And I got him to drop me off at my friend's house in a posher part of Liverpool as I didn't want him to see where I really lived in case that changed his opinion of me. And I got the bus back home from there. And um, whilst at KPMG, however, I've progressed at every level. I've literally grabbed every opportunity that came my way with both hands. The more senior I became, um, the more confident I was in my ability and the more authentic I was in my interactions. And I realized that this didn't hold me back. In fact, it helped me to progress as I brought different perspectives to conversations and clients could see that I, I was authentic and that I was genuinely interested in their business. And I've got the privilege of working with some of the brightest minds in the UK. And I've been on a journey of continuous learning since I joined KPMG and my actual education pales into insignificance, given what I've learned in my 20 years here. And it's only recently that I've felt really confident opening up about my background. So this concurs with Edward's point earlier. 
I was asked to share my story in a conversation with the Queen just before Christmas and I was essentially going to be bearing my soul to the world and that was a real turning point for me. I'm now happy to share my story and I want to use my position at KPMG to ensure that we go the extra mile to drive change and Jenny and I have been working together to get under the skin of social mobility at KPMG. As mentioned, we've set up a social mobility network that I'm the partner sponsor for. And since that's been set up, I've had a number of people from across the firm reach out to me to thank me for opening up the conversation. And I'm proof that you can progress in a professional services firm. I've got a coach at KPMG and she asked me recently what I wanted my legacy to be. And I said, I wanted to be a role model for others other females, other people who didn't have a privileged upbringing, other full-time working mums. I want people to look at me and think, well, if she can do it, so can I. Brilliant. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for sharing your story. And actually, there's a couple of comments that have come in the chat saying uh, such an open, insightful and relatable talk. Um, thank you for sharing so candidly and that your story is so inspiring. But love the way you named Jockford Queen, which is brilliant. <laughs> Um, if I um, thank you, Jen, um, if I could invite Jenny and Jason and Jen back, uh, we are going to have a, a panel now. So we've got questions coming in. You can uh, add more questions in there if you like, if anyone's got any other questions. But I think there's been a few questions about social mobility network. And, and Jen, you talked about setting up one. And I think we do have a lot of people who join our sessions who may not work in HR or DNI or talent management, but are part of a social mobility network of their organization or are looking to set one up. And so it'd be interesting to find out your thoughts in terms of how um, a social mobility network can support an organization to make change in this progression space. So maybe as the, the sponsor, uh, Jane, I'll come to you first um, as KPMG's sponsor of their network. Yeah, so I think the fact that we've got a network now is a, a massive um, advantage to us. Um, if I look back on, on my career at the start 20 years ago, I would have loved something like this to have been in place because you just need to know that you've got support and you are not alone. And this is a new network for us that we've just set up. And um, as Jenny said, we've got a network in Scotland that's been really successful. So we're really taking learnings from them as well. Um, but it's about raising our voices and letting people know that KPMG want you to be you. They want you to be authentic, sharing our stories and then bringing people along on that journey. Um, it'll be really useful actually to pick up on this conversation when we're a few months in because it, it is a new network so I'd, I'd quite happily come back and, and share reflections on how we've I guess progressed over the next couple of months. Jenny I don't know if there's anything that you would add. Yeah just to say that um, we've actually discussed whether we had a social mobility network for several years and um, I remember meeting with the, the cross-government social mobility networks and talking to the different government departments that had had them for some time um, and we were particularly interested in like the intersectional lens so we had some of our other employee networks talk to social mobility issues look at that intersectional lens um, but it was actually only when um, one of our fantastic apprentices, who spoke to the Queen alongside Jen, David McIntosh, um, had been sort of doing a lot of work locally in Scotland. And we realised the influence he was having with other colleagues and, and the power that there was in terms of his stories. And we felt that it was just a really opportune moment to expand it nationally. And so what am I looking to the network for? Insights as to what we might be missing their personal experiences around kind of barriers that they're seeing kind of every day so that actually we can have that continuous feedback loop in terms of our evolution of our strategy so yes we did that research a couple of years ago but actually what's it feel like now is it changing you know the feedback on the ground is going to be so pivotal for us brilliant yeah no I like that as well in terms of what does that look like in practice so the research shows you sort of what the barriers are from a policy perspective what's what's the reality what's the lived experience of those those colleagues does Jason, it feel can, any different <laughs> does it feel does it does it that that research actually reflect what you see and what you hear um jason if i could come to you because i know jenny's mentioned that they spoke with a number of um government uh, social mobility networks and i know a lot of our colleagues across government have social mobility networks and champions so perhaps um you could um 
uh, let us know how you think that the the based on the report that came out and the the actions how the networks might support you and and how other employers could really lean on their networks to support them yeah absolutely so so we meet regularly with our staff networks and our champions and for us they're absolutely a core part of how we inform our work on diversity and inclusion more broadly so we have a and, and staff network voice advisory group, which is composed of all of our cross government network um, staff groups. And in particular, they were engaged really closely on this report and inputting into the recommendations based on findings and evidence. And I think what's really interesting for me, so throughout my career, I've had roles as a champion in a department on social mobility and DNI, and I've led a staff network myself as a co chair of a gender equality network. Being an operational leader and now in HR, I think what I'd suggest is for those attendees who are a part of networks or looking to them, so working with champions, HR and DNI teams, as well as the business to lead meaningful change is absolutely essential. Holding organisations to account has its place. The most effective change that we see is often driven when all parties are actively engaged. And there's a couple of things that are super important for me. So firstly, being that driving force for positive change, working closely with stakeholders to just ensure that that employee voice is coming across from all backgrounds. So that's feeding into policy development, but really be part of the review process. So offering insights on how implementing policies, processes and practices are actually being interpreted by the groups that you can represent. And that really does tell that story and bring it to life that these policies that we're designing, are they having the intended impact and consequence that we desire? And being part of that iterative feedback loop is so essential. Brilliant, no, absolutely. That feedback loop is, is just key, isn't it? In terms of, of understanding how these, pol anything, that, anything that's gonna change, how it's gonna land, um, but also they've, they've been part of it and they can help be the, the communication across the organization. And we talked a bit about culturally being very open and honest about what's going on in the organization and, and, and raising that awareness. Um, we've got a question here um, in terms of, it, it, they talk about from a civil service perspective, but I think it's applicable across all um, employers, but I will come to you first, Jason. So could there be guidance given to civil service departments to not use words like brilliance in job adverts? Uh, because people from higher socioeconomic groups are more perceived to be brilliant, um, irrespective of their qualities rather than those from lower socioeconomic groups. And I wonder what, what you think of that, Jason. Well, I'd be, uh, I'm really intrigued to hear what some of the other panel members would say. I think my take on it is I think language is really powerful and there's some other questions uh, in the Q&A box around language and the impact that it can have. I think my take on it is actually guidance can always be provided, but the language changes and the, the, the impact of the words constantly changes and it becomes a bureaucracy in its own sake. I think what's really important is changing the culture so that all individuals in the civil service and across all employers are valued and deemed as being brilliant and the brightest and the best. And I think there's something about the report that speaks to that, about taking the most out of the talent that you've got in your organization by not just codifying that those at the top are of a certain background or a certain way of speaking or presenting or delivering work are deemed as being brilliant, but lots of different ways of thinking, of working and contributing is valued. So I think there's more emphasis that needs to be put on changing the culture to wrap around a new value and changing that codification. But I do think language is an important part of that. Brilliant, thank you. And I, I guess um, in terms of uh, Jen sharing her story then, others be sharing their story um, and the way she succeeded and, and is successful in KPMG uh, then will help others. So, so if you're doing that in, in your own organization, you're sharing individual stories of progression, uh, you're then sort of redefining the word of brilliance and what the organization is looking for. Jenny, do you have some thoughts on, on the language of adverts um, in terms of Hiring and I'm just trying to remember if I was Jen or Jenny today. I think I'm Jenny. <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think language is really important. It's what Jason said already. Um, we uh, really 
look carefully about in any um, adverts we have or, you know, when we advertise opportunities internally as much as, you know, recruitment externally as well. Um, you know, there's kind of proven evidence to suggest that it can really put off people from applying, whether that's from a gender, socioeconomic background, ethnicity perspective. So we do need to be really considerate in that. Um, and I'd even share, I don't know if I've, I'm hoping this is okay, but when we were, um, for example, appointing our um, new chief executive, my um, head of, our chief people officer, sorry, asked me to look at it from an IDSC lens to make sure that actually the language we were using um, was exactly talking to, you know, the sort of candidate we were looking for and that there wasn't any sort of unwritten rules embedded in some of this language. And um, so I think it's a really important consideration. Um, there's probably more we could be doing. We use certain external organizations to kind of sense check some of the language we use. Um, but yeah, a really important point um, that I think organisations should be looking at. Brilliant, thank you. Um, there's another question in here, and it sort of ties in really in terms of how you balance fair and open recruitment. And I know there's there's differences for organisations in terms of the way progression happens. So in some organisations, you apply for your next promotion. In others, you go to a promotion panel. Um, and, and I wonder whether there's anything um, in terms of, of how you work to ensure that that process, uh, you talked about it quite a bit, uh, Jenny, earlier in terms of the, the, pro the processes and really reviewing those processes to ensure that you are meeting open, open and fair treatment of, of individuals. So is there anything explicit you want to mention around those processes? Yeah, happy to elaborate. Um, if I just think about internal progression and, and promotion of opportunities. So um, at the more senior levels, we do have like journey to partner or journey to director type programs. Um, and we obviously therefore try and take a longer term kind of view in terms of that talent pipeline. Are we really considering everyone that um, may be ready, could be ready? What support do we need to put in place? Um, particularly thinking about um, all of our talent. Um, and then our sort of people processes, we've built in kind of an IDSE checkpoint, if I can call it that, at various stages. So that's, you know, yes, at recruitment, but really particularly around promotion stages. So we tend to have an interim promotion stage and a year end um, promotion stage. So we do a lot of IDSE checks in there. We do it when we're looking at salary and bonus. You know, any point that there might be something that potentially bias could have crept in, my team are heavily involved in doing sort of an aggregate set of analysis to make sure we're really sense checking. And all of the businesses have specific IDSE action plans in addition to what we drive centrally. So, you know, there are actions and commitments they're making um, in order to drive that change. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and Jason, in terms of the work that you've seen happen in different departments within the civil service, uh, in terms of that fair and, and uh, uh, open recruitment or really hiring in, in sorry, progression rather. So for, for me, um, the, the story that Jenny told is really pertinent to this. So the civil service recruitment is underpinned by uh, merit and fairness and transparency and we're very robust on that the the thing that we're trying to get to is that equality of opportunity so jenny described for example imposter syndrome so when you when you when you bring together what this report findings show that this is a labyrinth that there are lots of opportunities but they're well hidden and that path to success can be hard to overcome when you then doubt yourself anyway and put in those hurdles and barriers to seizing those opportunities even when they arise or for the language of the report almost you stumble upon them what i've seen a lot of departments do is investing time on individuals not to make them adopt or adapt certain processes or styles of representing or delivery but actually just appreciate the value that they bring to an organization very often when I'm in a recruitment campaign, we are looking for different types of individuals. We want that creativity, that diversity of thought. We want to bring in innovation into the organisation and people just assume that we're looking for a certain type or mould. Supporting individuals, Home Office have done a lot of work in particular on the syndrome, cutting across social mobility, in particular gender as well, to actually give confidence back into individuals to be able to apply once those opportunities are presented to them and I think we've touched on throughout all the presentations today that that confidence of individuals is really key 
Brilliant. Thank you. Um, that actually leads on to there's there's a couple of questions in the chat um, that have talked about, you know, why does everything change the individual as opposed to and, and thank you for clarifying that. And, and so on the basis of that, um, uh, Jenny and Jen, I don't know if you want to share a bit more about what your GROW programme uh, does, because um, obviously, uh, you know, you're not changing those individuals, you are uh, developing them. Uh, in, in in a different way. So if you could share a bit more about that, that'd be great. Yeah, Jen, do you mind if I go first? Great. Um, yeah, happy to tell us. I, I think it's a really important observation and yeah, absolutely not wanting to change the individual. And that was why I hopefully in my presentation talked about systems uh, first, because that's actually really critical to, to get right. And then there's things that you can do around changing behaviours of all colleagues. But um, our GROW program has been around since 2015. It started as a sort of career development program um, for uh, our female um, population, particularly looking at um, the sort of transition to senior grades. So we have a manager, senior manager, director, partner, um, and we often saw people kind of dropping off between that manager, senior manager grade. And um, it's gradually expanded um, now in terms of the program itself individuals kind of help discover their personal work um, and leadership style um, reflecting on the impact that that can have on your career success I think recognizing that at the more senior level it's not always what you know it's your networks it's your ability to influence it's kind of how you work with other people so it's working on what's your personal style that you might use and um, it helps the individual develop a greater understanding of image and exposure through being more authentic as leaders um, helping work through kind of that career development plan kind of what are you wanting to focus on what do you want your legacy to be a bit to Jen's point kind of how can we help you get there um, and then looking at kind of obstacles um, to performance success kind of helping break those down it's kind of done in a group forum I actually did the program a couple of years ago um, and you really benefit from sharing experiences across the organization um, in terms of what they're experiencing how you can critique and help one another so um, yeah it's been a really successful program internally in terms of not just kind of people being promoted but actually um, kind of experiences and the feedback we've had and then sort of it supporting retention as well. Brilliant. Jen do you have anything to add were you part of the program or do you put people through it? So I, I wasn't part of the program um, but what we do at KPMG is you can I guess, choose your own path and your own learning. So, you know, I think it was Jason who spoke earlier around making sure learning is accessible to all. Well, it absolutely is at KPMG. So it's a case of, you know, re you really taking hold of your career and looking and saying, do I need those softer skills, right? Well, these are the courses that I'm going to book on. Do I want to do more collaborative work in a group while I might join the GROW programme? So I think it's opening all of those opportunities up to everyone so that they can really choose how they want to steer their career. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we are sadly moving towards the, the end of, of our discussion. Um, and we often, you know, people have been on the on the session for an hour and a half. What was their key takeaway? They've obviously got their own notes. But but I wonder if if uh, each of the panel members could just maybe share one thing. If, if you're starting to look at progression, uh, what's the one thing that would really help drive this? Uh, change in in others organizations so Jason I'll come to you first thanks Paula so I think in many organizations attraction is focused on which is really important but a positive workplace culture ensures that investment made in attraction are actually optimized a really good place to start is by collecting said data as part of your HR recording systems perhaps, for example, on a voluntary basis uh, with clarity on terminology and self-identification. But without that data, what I think it's really important to just take a look at other activities around gender or around race, you can stumble through this sometimes. Having that data, having that evidence is really key to make sure that your interventions are targeted in the right place and have purpose and meaning for those that receive them in your organisation. So I will always say data, data, data. Brilliant. Thank you. Jenny? I don't want to just echo what Jason said. But, um, as <laughs> Choose a trained, your second best. <laughs> as a trained accountant, I would echo that data is really important. But um, I, look, those insights are really important so you know within your organisation actually what might be um, helping people get ahead. The thing for us was really unpacking the work allocation piece, and that still remains a big focus because it's 
essentially breaking down how we do everyday business. Um, but we know that some people have those career enhancing opportunities and continue to be put on those. And that's what gets them ahead. So, you know, that for me is probably the, the biggest thing at KPMG that we're focusing on. Brilliant. And Jen? So for me, it's about, you know, yes, you've got to attract the people, but how do you retain them? So what do you do as an organization to make sure that your practices really are inclusive? So, you know, do you act upon the data that you receive when people leave the business? If they say, you know, they, they haven't felt included, what, what steps do you put in place to make sure that that doesn't happen next time round? And just really thinking about the fact that all businesses benefit from having a diverse workforce. So you want to keep a lot of diversity there. And, and the only way you can do that is by talking to people throughout the career and saying, what have we done well? What haven't we done well? So it's that continuous learning as a firm as to how do we not only attract the right people, but retain them. Brilliant. Thank you. And that I, could, I think that kind of loops into to what I would say. I'd actually choose to, I would say, uh, performance reviews. So having those career conversations. So we all have it in our gift. Everyone who's on this, this webinar has it in their gift to talk about um, career conversations. So if you're a line manager, you have it in the gift to, to have conversations with all of your team. And if you're a team member, you have it in your gift to ask your line manager about it. Um, so that ties in, I think, very nicely with your point there, Jen. And I think uh, one of the key things is if, if you're not looking at your talent within your, your diverse talent within your organisation, you can bet that other people externally are looking at that talent and they would be ready to move. So, um, it, you know, driving those conversations. Um, so I just want to thank um, our speakers for joining the, the, the panel. Um, I'm just going to try and share my slides again, uh, just to uh, finalise uh, some key dates that are coming up. So I'm hoping you'll be able to see them. Um, that's the panel. Um, so next steps, what's the next steps for everyone? So uh, we will be sending out an after pack um, to everyone who's on the call. So please do complete our feedback. Um, that after pack will contain the recording uh, and also um, access to the recording, access to the report uh, that we mentioned earlier, the civil service report, um, and also the slide deck. Um, and if you want to find out some more resources, please do visit our socialmobilityworks.org uh, website where you'll find um, resources for uh, hiring progression, uh, data collection. I know there were some questions in the chat around uh, what data do you need to collect? So please do visit that resource. Um, I'm delighted to say the next time uh, we will be, uh, our next masterclass is on the 1st of July at 1 p.m. Uh, you'll get the registration link after this session and we're delighted that we're joined by Superdrug who will be talking about uh, leadership and culture so it's Caroline King their head of people and reward um, and then their director uh, their customer and people director uh, Joanne Mackey so um, delighted that they are going to join us to talk about their experiences and how they've uh, they're building a inclusive culture for socio-economic uh, di diversity so please do uh, try and join us for that. Um, calling all employers out there, if there's anyone out there, we're running a session. We, uh, If you visited our website, uh, you would have seen that we have a number of toolkits and we're putting together a toolkit regarding app uh, apprenticeships. And we would love uh, employers who are involved in delivering apprenticeship programs to join us. Um, so if you want to, we'll, we'll share the actual links afterwards, but if you want to join us uh, to register uh, for these sessions, they're workshop type sessions and they'll really kind of dive into the, the heart of um, how can you make your uh, apprenticeships um, how can we develop a toolkit for other employers that will enable them to develop really diverse uh, um, apprenticeship programs? Uh, because we've know there's it's been recorded. Some of the research that we've done has shown that over the last few years, um, uh, less and less people from lower socioeconomic background have, have accessed 
uh, apprenticeship roles. So, um, so that would be great if anyone has got any insight to that and they want to join us. Um, just a couple of dates for our diaries from our partners uh, and people we work closely with. So um, if you are uh, doing great work in the this space, then please do consider applying for a social mobility award. Um, so that would be great. Uh, the nominations are now open and the deadline's about a month's time. So if you want to visit uh, www.somo.uk, you will be able to find out how to do that there. Um, and then um, for uh, those of you who are, who are probably in the midst of uh, already writing your index submission, just a reminder, uh, and Jenny very kindly pointed out to me earlier on the session that actually uh, the submissions have been extended to June the 11th, um, uh, but those uh, submissions close. And then for those of you not already engaged with the employer index, I would uh, recommend that you visit some of the the uh, report that they once they've um, you know published their key findings in the autumn um, have a look to see what best practice they're sharing and those organizations who, who feature in the top 75 uh, percent so the top 75 um, have a look to see what they're doing so it just remains for me to once again thank all of our speakers so Jenny, Jen, Jason and Edward um, and my colleague who was obviously on earlier um, and thank you for joining us and um, see you next time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. Bye. Thank you. Bye.